In this video, I'm going to tell you stories about people from the book Never Be Sick Again that became sick randomly, but doctors couldn't find a cause or a cure. If you or someone you know is in a similar condition, some of these stories could spike an idea for you. But first, a disclaimer. I'm not a qualified healthcare professional and the information provided is for general information purposes only. Tragically, three out of four Americans have medically significant cellular malfunction or in other words a diagnosable disease of some kind. The overwhelming majority of us are somewhere between diagnosable disease and death. Think about your personal health equation, your position on this health and performance scale. Do you have a diagnosable disease? If so, you are located between disease and death. Now disease isn't what you actually think it is like Ebola or something. It, it can be like any sort of illness so like if you have hay fever if you have diabetes if you have anything other than optimal health then you're not at perfect health whereas if you have perfect health you never get ill like you don't even get a cold once a year and that's where you want to be if you're not there then you're only working towards disease because if your body isn't in optimal health it's obviously in a disease state where it's getting worse and worse and over time you're gonna then get an illness and again it's not you just suddenly get an illness and you're unlucky. It's what you've built up over your lifetime of either taking in toxins or not getting the nutrients you need. Fortunately, your health on this continuum is not static. It can change depending on your choices. You can reverse your unhealthiness. Well, actually, you can reverse your aging, the way your cells are aging. And again, as I mentioned many times, a guy called Brian Johnson, you can watch him on YouTube. He's doing some great things. So the guy that wrote this book says, I learned this firsthand in making powerful life-saving choices after it was declared a medical certainty that I would die. He was given a certain amount of months to live and he was like, everything that he touched or went near or smelled, like even turning his TV on would turn, would send him into like a toxic overload and he'd get really ill and he reversed his illness. He says, I learned it again years later after witnessing the illness and extraordinary recovery of an elderly woman. A family called me to ask for help with their bedridden and senile mother. The woman was 94 years old and unable to get out of bed. Sometimes she recognised her family and knew where she was. At other times she did not. Her children loved her very much and did not want to place her in a nursing home yet the burden of her care had become too much for them. With nowhere else to turn, they asked if there was anything I could recommend. My reply was probably not. Given the woman's debilitated condition, I assumed that her health had deteriorated beyond repair. At a certain point, enough cellular machinery has been damaged that sufficient repairs can no longer be made. Though I was pessimistic about the likelihood of an improvement, the family asked for my advice anyway. In retrospect, I found out that I still had a lot to learn about the capacity of the human body to heal itself. I started out by recommending some specific vitamin supplements to help supply certain key nutrients to her cells. When I asked what she was eating, the first item they mentioned was milk. After years of study, I had come to realise that cow's milk is not an appropriate food for any human being. For someone in her condition, cow's milk was almost certainly putting a toxic load on her already struggling body. I recommended that they stop feeding her milk. As I hung up the phone, I doubted that these suggestions would have much of an impact or that I would ever hear from them again. Two weeks later, the phone rang with gleeful reports of her miraculous improvement. She was getting out of bed, going to the bathroom and getting dressed all by herself. She was walking around the house and having rational conversations with her family. A miracle? No. Just a movement of her health equation in the right direction. By addressing her cellular deficiency and toxicity, this woman's body began once again to repair and regulate itself. Indeed, I have learned that almost anyone can alter his or her health equation in a positive direction. Now, as I said, illness never happens without a cause. The cause is usually our own ignorance of or disregard for, f for our personal health. So how can you avoid getting sick? Simple eating a normal diet and living a normal life are virtually guaranteed to make you sick. To prevent this from happening, you must be proactive. As Joseph D. Beasel, MD, said in the Kellogg Report, in the long run, individuals cannot be better than their biology as affected by their nutrition, ecology and lifestyle. The key to never having to be sick again is the ability to choose between the things that are healthy and the things that are not. This sounds simple, but accurate information about what is healthy is hard to come by. So there's going to be a lot of B-roll, which is like overlaying videos because I'm reading exactly what the story is because I can't memorise the whole story. I don't think anyone can, or maybe I can't yet until I've 
named a memory bear. Now this is a summarized story about a man whose whole world fell apart. A man named David, once successful in his career and living a lavish lifestyle, found himself in a downward spiral of unexplained health issues, leading to severe depression and suicidal thoughts. Despite numerous medical consultations and tests, his condition worsened. Eventually, it was discovered that David's excessive consumption of mercury laden tuna fish, it, pretty much it's just tuna in general, is always full of mercury, compounded by mercury exposure from dental fillings, had led to mercury poisoning. A lengthy conversation with an acquaintance led to his realization. With proper treatment, including nutritional supplements and chelatian therapy, David recovered and was able to resume a normal life. So, as I said, that was just a simplified story, but he like became ill, couldn't work, became depressed, went on holiday, didn't get any better, was aggressive and mean to his family, so his wife left him and went with the kids. So then he went into depression even deeper because he felt like he had nothing to live for. And then his last resort, his friend heard about the guy who wrote the book, and so he called the guy that wrote the book and he like couldn't work it out but then he, he like they, he always went through what people eat and he saw that he was eating tuna and as i said tuna is very high in mercury he also had a i think he had a bit of a failed surgery on his teeth or it was just generally he had fillings and he had mercury poisoning so they got rid of the mercury stuff and took nutritional supplements to remove mercury and to also rejuvenate all his nutrient deficiencies and he became fine again and moved back in with his family and everything. Now here's a story about a little girl that just randomly started having seizures frequently. Several years ago, a young married couple from Chicago asked me to help their three-year-old daughter, Anne, who was experiencing seizures. Anne had been examined by at least a dozen specialists, but their only recommendation were anti-seizure medication that made Anne sick, yet failed to stop the seizures. Desperate parents called me, a complete stranger, 2,000 miles away. They begged me for help, even though I'm not a physician. Because there is only one disease, allegedly, <laughs> I knew that Anne's problem was malfunctioning cells. But why were they malfunctioning? Although I asked many questions about Anne's history, nothing seemed unusual about her birth, background, or development. She had been breastfed, a good thing, even though breast milk is toxic, it is still preferable to the alternatives, and her diet was actually better than average. In fact, she had been remarkably ever since birth until the seizures started. I began to ask questions about her environment. As it turned out, during most of her young life, Anne had been sleeping in a crib in her parents' bedroom. When she outgrew the crib, her parents decided she could have her own bedroom. Knowing that brand new room furnishings can be quite toxic, I focused on environmental toxins as the probable cause of the little girl's problem. I learned that before the onset of the seizures, Anne's new bedroom had been given a fresh coat of paint and was furnished with new wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, a new t television set, and new furniture, including a new bed and mattress. In fact, that new bedroom has just about every amenity that any set of loving parents could give to their beloved daughter. But it was also a poisonous gas chamber. The new paint, carpet, mattress, television and furniture constructed of particle board which contains formaldehyde were all giving off toxic gases. You recognise the typical new paint smell, that new carpet smell and that new furniture smell. They are all toxic, especially when they are brand new, at which time they emit higher concentrations of chemicals. Shut anybody inside a bedroom like little Anne's for eight or ten hours a night and the person is exposed to a lot of toxins. Anne was in a toxic overload and her seizures were the result. Often in a case like this, when you remove the source of the toxins, you cure the disease. Instead, Anne's physicians had prescribed anti-seizure medication, which added to her toxic overload, making her sicker. I suggested an experiment to Anne's parents. Close off the toxic bedroom and allow Anne to sleep in another room for a few weeks. The result, the seizures stopped and Anne returned to being a normal and healthy child. So as you can see, there's some very normal things that you, well, that you think are normal, like paint, but he actually said in the book that you should leave a, like a newly painted house for like a month to air before you then go and move into it because it, paint is just so toxic to be breathing in all the time. You're pretty much in your own poisonous gas chamber, as it said. So so many stories in here that, again, normal things could be causing you an illness. So just think of things that, well, you could even search things up if you actually do have an illness like what could be toxic in your daily life and you'll soon find out what you need to cut out and what 
you should and shouldn't be doing. Now, here's a story about a woman called Sally that found out how bad indoor air pollution can actually be. Few people know better the incredible amount of damage that can be done by indoor air pollution than Sally. A young newlywed, Sally was truly brought to my office. Her husband had to carry her from their car. She did not have enough energy to walk or even told her head up straight while seated. Sally was suffering from acute chronic fatigue, a condition that physicians are not trained to recognise or understand. She and her husband had already spent many thousands of dollars on consultations with physicians and diagnostic tests. Unable to find anything physically wrong, Sally's doctor referred her to a psychiatrist. Of course Sally was not crazy, but she was very sick. Her cells were malfunctioning so badly that she had become totally disabled. The couple's responses to my questions, in addition to my own experience with chemical sensitivity, allowed me to understand what was wrong. First, like most 45-year-olds, Sally had frequently been given antibiotics throughout her life. Antibiotics cause fundamental and damaging changes to human phys physiology. This intake resulted in a heightened susceptibility to environmental toxins. I asked many questions about Sally's medical history, diet, lifestyle and, env and environment before focusing on the toxin pathway factor. Sally was a writer and her husband had converted their oversized laundry room into an office for her. Also in that room was a gas-fired water heater. Natural gas appliances release toxic gases, including nitrogen dioxide, carbon monoxide and small amounts of natural gas itself. With insufficient ventilation, the gas became concentrated and poor Sally was breathing them all day long. She began to suffer from sore throats, eye irritations, respiratory problems, headaches and eventually chronic fatigue. I recommend they install an electric hot water heater. Sally's worst symptoms immediately were alleviated. Although significant damage had already been done, both by the gases and the antibiotics, her health was restored eventually after she worked to reverse the damage through improved diet and nutritional supplementation. One of the great joys in my life is to watch someone like Sally go from being sick and disabled with little to look forward to, to smiling once again and enjoying life. I am saddened to think how many people remain sick because their physicians do not understand the toxin pathway and have no idea how to help them. In fact, physicians who prescribe antibiotics and more medication often create susceptibility to such problems in the first place. Gas-fired appliances, hot water heaters, ovens, stoves, furnaces, fireplaces and clothes dryers diffuse toxic gases into the surrounding air. If you have such appliances, try to keep them out of your living space and put furnaces, clothes dryers and water heaters in a garage, shed or breezeway, along with stored volatiles such as paints and cleaning fluids. A gas stove, because it is in your living space, should be replaced or at least very well ventilated. In my own recovery process, I'd convert from a gas to an electric water heater because I had become so sensitive to these toxins. So I'm speaking first person, but this is the guy that wrote the book. Giving off toxic gases is an especially common problem with products when they are new. At one of my seminars, a woman named Diane raised her hand and explained that she was suffering from splitting headaches. After hearing the story about Sally, Diane realised that her headaches coincided with the purchase of a new car. She suspected a condition. Her new car was off-gassing toxins, producing the new car smell. Diane's family had two cars, so I suggested that she drive the older car until the odour subsided. Her headaches went away. Some highly sensitive people retrofit their cars with safer materials. Consider the risk of new products. A new carpet, a freshly painted room, a new TV set, a new mattress. New products give off high levels of toxic chemicals with the passage of time. The volume of toxic chemicals being off-gassed drops dramatically. Often you can accelerate the off-gassing process simply by applying heat. For example, the chemicals contained in a new car's plastics, adhesives and seating materials pollute the interior air of the car during the first few months. Try to leave a new car parked in, a, in the hot sun with the windows up to bake out the toxins. Air it out regularly and be sure to air it out before and while you drive. The risk of new pain is something my friend Jim discovered when he went from being generally in good spirits to suffering the worst depression of his life. Actually, he fell suicidal. 
I immediately tried to isolate the cause of Jim's malfunctioning cells. I discovered that Jim just had the interior of his house painted. Paint off gases, neurotoxins that can affect moods and mental function. New paint takes at least two months to eat to reach reasonable levels of safety for most people, depending on biochemical individuality. Which is why it is best to paint only one room at a time and close freshly painted rooms off as much as possible while they are off gassing. Absolutely do not sleep in a freshly painted room. A good idea is to schedule painting just before leaving on a vacation. Jim stayed at his son's house for several weeks and his problem was solved. Another example of toxic off-gassing was brought to my attention when a woman suffering flu-like symptoms came to me for help. Ellen Marie had caught the flu around Christmas time the previous year and still was not well. Her physicians were dumbfounded as anyone would be if they focused only on mitigating her symptoms. I discovered Ellen Marie had moved into a newly constructed luxury home four months prior to coming down with the flu. Her new home was constructed with particle board, which off-gasses formaldehyde, a highly toxic carcinogenic chemical. Plywood also will off-gas formaldehyde, but far less of it. Some new man-made building materials no longer contain formaldehyde, but the substitutes used such as isocyanates are also toxic. The poor woman was suffering from subtle and constant formaldehyde poisoning. Her symptoms included immune suppression, respiratory problems, coughing, throat irritation, headaches, insomnia, nausea and fatigue. I suggested to Ellen Marie that she sell her new home and move to a safe environment. She chose not to move and she remained ill. Always select building materials and furniture that are made from real wood or at least plywood, but not particle board. Now this book really is the best book I've ever read, and I think everyone should be brought up reading this, so that everyone in the world, parents, kids, everyone knows about it. So it's called Never Be Sick Again, and you can get it from the link in my description if you want, which just takes you to Amazon, and I just get a commission from it. It costs you no more, it's just the same price, but it helps me out. Now if you want to learn more about real health, you should watch my video called Is Never Getting Sick Really Possible? which is on screen now. Thank you for watching and see you in the next one.